The Tom Woods Show, episode 1140. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, Bob Murphy and I are doing it again. Contra Cruise 2018. You know you want to join us. You've seen how much fun it is. Everybody who's joined us absolutely raves about it. It is the vacation of a lifetime. Check it out at ContraCruise.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Very exciting today because we're going to be talking about a book by Murray Rothbard. But what's interesting about this book is that it's brand new. It really just came out a matter of months ago whereas Rothbard died in January 1995, new material from Rothbard has emerged from the archives pretty consistently in the decades following his death, and it is quite an extraordinary phenomenon. But this is the book I've been waiting for. It's called The Progressive Era, edited by Patrick Newman, our guest today, and it contains a lot of brand new, never-before-seen material on such a critical episode in American history. Rothbard, as most of you know, was known as Mr. Libertarian in his day, was extraordinarily prolific to the point that he can continue to release books even after passing on. It's quite extraordinary. So Patrick Newman joins us once again. He is a professor of economics at Florida Southern College. Patrick, welcome back. Thanks for having me on, Tom. So you put together this brand new Murray Rothbard book. This is the year, when did it come out last year, 2017? Yeah, fall 2017. Yeah, so 2017, Rothbard died in January of 95, so almost 23 years later, there's another Rothbard book. So I have got to just know before we get into the details of what's covered in it, what the story behind this is. Because some of the chapters in here are reproduced from academic journal articles or chapters in other books and things like that, but a very substantial chunk of it is all new material that's never been seen before. What is the origin of that? Great question. So basically in the 1970s, one of Rothbard's many projects that he was working on was a book on the progressive era in the late 1970s. And he really wanted to cover sort of the whole transformation of American government from the Civil War uh, to about the Great Depression. Uh, he gave a lecture uh, series that's uh, online at the Mises Institute called The American Economy and the End of Laissez-Faire, 1870 to World War II. Uh, in the 80s, and it's very similar on what he wanted to cover in the book. So anyway, he wrote about nine chapters of this book. Uh, the full book manuscript includes everything from railroad interventions in the 1880s to the President Theodore Roosevelt administration in uh, the uh, early 20th century. And by the early 80s, he was working on other projects, and his, you know, his, his research interests sort of shifted and he stopped working on the Progressive Era book, and what he he sort of finished the remaining chapters by writing them in the form of published essays. So some of these are the Federal Reserve as a cartelization device, uh, the origins of the welfare state, uh, World War I as fulfillment, uh, sort of these classic uh, essays. So this book really contains both the nine unpublished chapters as well as the six published essays to sort of create a relatively unified book. And the total book is around 600 pages, and new material is roughly half, around 300 pages. So it's certainly a uh, – this is not just the table scraps uh, of uh, unpublished Rothbard writings, but this is some, uh, this is some serious stuff. Yeah, no kidding. And, and incidentally, the material that is appearing once again that's been in – various other books or in academic journals or whatever is really great. As you say, these are classic pieces. One of my favorites, uh, I'll say something about it later, is uh, one of his essays on World War I and just the ideological aspect on the domestic front, that this was an opportunity. This wasn't a, uh, you know, something to be regretted. Oh, well, it's too bad we're at war. The planners never think that way. It's, oh my goodness, what a, what a domestic opportunity this poses for us. So I, what I thought we might do is run through just a basic overview of some of the newer material in the book. And then if people want more, they can get this book, they can buy it, they can read it online. There are a lot of options. They have a, they're going to be treated to an introduction by you and a forward by Judge Napolitano. So this is uh, that, those are both great things. And then also in your introduction, you note that, uh, of course, this was an incomplete manuscript that you had. And so 
if Rothbard had gone back and gone through it, he certainly would have added in a lot of notes and he would have changed things and whatever. And so you did your best to approximate what that might have looked like and inserting footnotes that weren't there that certainly or that very likely were pointing to the sources Rothbard had in mind and so on. By the way, what was that process like? Easy? Hard? <laughs> uh, sure. So, yeah, the, 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 the manuscript was in a, was in a rough state. Uh, obviously, he wrote it on a typewriter, so there were – cross things out. Sometimes he would handwrite paragraphs. Uh, he'd handwrite sentences. He'd scribble things out. And, uh, yeah, in order to – you know, if you wanted to publish the material, obviously, it's unpublished. Uh, it was unfinished. You don't just want to publish the the you know the sort of the very rough draft and leave it as it is because it would kind of be like well you know he didn't give it his stamp of approval. Um, you know one of the things I did as you mentioned was sort of everything I did was prefaced with an editorial footnote so you know okay what's Rothbard stuff what's what, what was my own sort of okay here is the references for what you know he was referring to so you could look it up. Uh, the pages or the particular quotes, et cetera, statistics, uh, as well as just sort of provide some editorial commentary on um, some research that Rothbard was heavily influenced by, but he didn't cite, or just something else in another work of his that, hey, he also spoke about this here. Um, it was a very challenging process. It was thoroughly enjoyable, though. I mean, I, I won't lie. Uh, it was a treasure hunt, finding all of the, uh, the nine uh, unpublished chapters, sometimes the archives, they could be all over the place in the archives, the papers. And, uh, yeah, we managed to find all the pages because he fortunately, uh, and, you know, he, he wrote on the top of each of them, uh, the, the chapter and then the, and then the page number. And for some of them, he even had them in lecture notes from some of his classes. So we really had to dig through everything to, to, to get it all. But, uh, it was a, it was a very enjoyable process. I won't lie, but it was very challenging. Uh, but you know, was, I, I would do it all over again. You know, I didn't do quite the the footwork that that you had to do, but I did write the introduction for his book, The Betrayal of the American Right, and I was considered to be the editor of that. And there, you had it had gone through a number of drafts, and he had crossed some things out, but he crossed some things out that you could still read. And sometimes he was crossing things out about contemporaries of his like he had had a very negative assessment of at one point in the life of that manuscript. And then he crossed those things out because maybe he had rethought it or maybe he had reconciled with those people because it was a very autobiographical book. And I had somebody telling me, not anybody with any sense like Lou Rockwell, but I had somebody telling me, well, you know what? Let's just publish it. Let's let's include the crossed out stuff. Let's put it all in there. And I, I just said, no, I think that's that would be to dishonor his wishes. And if, if I had a manuscript and I had deliberately crossed things out, which meant that my most recent assessment of this is I do not want to include this, I would consider it a betrayal if somebody went ahead and published that. So in that case, especially because we're dealing with events from his life and people he knew and in many cases had come to respect, I thought it was best to just keep that stuff out. But it's interesting to be in a position where you're making that that kind of decision about the work of somebody you admire so much. You gotta you know, proceed very carefully and bearing in mind what, what his wishes are. Now, let's talk about, I wanna actually skip ahead, if you don't mind, to chapter three, called Attempts at Monopoly in American History, which includes, but is not limited to, a discussion of the failed merger movement of 1897 to 1901, which, by the way, you would think, if um, a Marxist were looking at that, there shouldn't be, there's no way there could be a failed merger movement, right? It, shouldn't it always be better for there to be more economic centralization and, and fewer firms, and yet there was a failed merger movement? But what's what's the basic thesis? What's, what's Rothbard's basic point in the chapter on attempts at monopoly? You sort of get it right from the title. Yeah, so uh, this is one of my favorite chapters. Uh, if there was one of those chapters, it's almost like Man, Economy, and State, we say if there's one chapter that was standalone, uh, you know, what you know, it could be a standalone sort of uh, essay. What chapter would it be in a man, economy, and state? I would think it'd be on monopoly and competition. Yeah. Also, some of his most original insights. And lo and behold, <laughs> what would be the best standalone chapter in this book as well? The same thing on monopoly and competition in the progressive era. And uh, the basic thesis for this chapter is so around the turn of the century, from approximately 1897 to about 1901. There was this big merger movement 
where various businesses, they were in the process of basically merging together to try and achieve these very large uh, monopolies. So to get uh, enormous market share and to be able to use that to restrict production and raise prices. So they're saying, okay, competition doesn't work. Our new strategy is just to simply try and buy everyone out. And Rothbard goes through this. He goes through uh, oil. He goes through steel. He goes through uh, agricultural machinery, sugar. Uh, so these large companies like Standard Oil, uh, U.S. Steel, International Harvester, et cetera. And he, he basically uh, shows that, well, all these attempts failed, uh, even in the presence of high tariffs that blocked out foreign competition, mainly because of either internal pressure or external pressure. So cartels, they would break down from cheating. That's internal pressure. External pressure is when uh, basically new competitors uh, would enter in and they would undercut the monopoly. And uh, that was the big reason uh, for why, you know, he goes to really time after time again, sort of showing that, well, none of these mergers uh, work. And this is Rothbard's sort of motivation for why business supported legislation in the progressive era, both federal and state, because it was a way of achieving those uh, cartels. If you couldn't achieve the monopoly on the, on the market through market means, you would instead try and achieve it uh, through government means by obtaining various you know, restrictions on your competitors, et cetera. So I love the chapter. I think it's a great chapter. And of course, the thing that we're supposed to dislike about monopolies is that supposedly they raise prices. That's the thing. I mean, they withhold output, but the key thing is they raise prices higher than they would have been if we had had competition in the, you know, more competition in the colloquial sense of the term. But as it turns out, that's not even the case. They they didn't raise prices. And by the time the government got around to trying to break some of them up, for example, the classic case being Standard Oil, by the time the case finally makes it to court, Standard Oil's market share is way, way down, maybe a, uh, maybe a quarter of the market from upwards of 80 to 90 percent of the market. But even then, even when it had 80 to 90 percent of, of the ref of oil refinery, it still was lowering prices dramatically and consistently over time. So the story is the opposite, I mean, is the total opposite of what kids learn in school, or at least what is strongly implied when this material is conveyed to kids. The exact opposite is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly correct. And you know, one thing I, uh, you know, Rothbard really goes through is he said, yes, these businesses, you know, I'm not ascribing them, you know, holier than thou motives. They were certainly trying to achieve monopoly so they could then restrict production and raise prices. But the only way to do that was you first had to create a product that everyone wanted. You had to produce a better quality product at a lower price. And that's how you gain market share. And of course, they could never get to that point where you could finally sit back, you know, put your, your feet on the table and, and then just raise prices because you always had some new competitor to deal with or some new technological innovation, et cetera. I mean, that's just the market process. That's the ruthless nature of competition. Um, you know, Rothbard was heavily influenced. Uh, he cited this, uh, this economist uh, also in Man, Economy, and State. His name was Arthur Dewing. He was a contemporary in the progressive era, and he wrote in uh, you know, he wrote many books. Uh, he Rothbard quotes uh, something he wrote in about 1914, and I love this quote because he says this is Arthur Dewing sort of commenting on the the merger movement, and he says, "quote I've been impressed throughout by the powerlessness of mer aggregates of capital to hold monopoly. I've been impressed too by the tremendous importance of individual." innate ability or its lack in determining the success or failure of any enterprise. With these observations in mind, one may hazard the belief that whatever, quote, trust problem exists will work out on its own solution, end quote. So, you know, this is a very laissez-faire, look, the market will take care of these monopolies. And I, I think it's a great analysis. And I think Rothbard really, you know, hits the nail on the head with this chapter. All right, let's talk about this, the special case of railroads, simply because Rothbard devotes so much time to, to the railroads. Two chapters on this and two Rothbard chapters is pretty heavy with a lot of detail as we're accustomed to from him. So what would be the Reader's Digest takeaway there? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, like as you mentioned, you two chapters on the railroads. Uh, what's funny is you mentioned earlier about Rothbard crossing things out and 
uh, you know, revising drafts. And I could tell that he originally planned to just have one chapter on the railroads. <laughs> and then uh, he actually just planned to have, you know, one just section on all railroads and mergers, et cetera. And then he just, all right, I'll do one chapter on the railroads. And he says, well, I got to do two chapters on the railroads. Um, so this is the, you know, the railroad quote unquote merger movement happened earlier than the rest of business. So this was mainly in the 1880s. Uh, this, these two chapters basically talk about the formation of the 1887 uh, Interstate Commerce Commission and sort of how railroads were one of the players involved in supporting some sort of new act. Chapter one talks about the transcontinental railroad subsidies and how railroad cartels or pools didn't work. In chapter two basically goes through the whole legislative process surrounding the 1887 Interstate Commerce Act as well as the railroad's attempts to later use the act to try and achieve these cartels. And, you know, Rothbard goes through that actually railroads weren't really that successful. Uh, they, they, they kept trying to use it, but the, the, the pools, the, the railroad cartels kept breaking down. And ultimately, by basically the turn of, you know, the you know, World War I, the rival interest group, basically the shippers, who, you know, would uh, pay railroads to uh, transport goods to, you know, across the country, they ended up getting control of the, 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 the bureaucratic agency. So it really goes through sort of the dynamics of intervention and just sort of the whole process behind railroad regulation. It's really two very fascinating chapters. Yeah, no kidding. Now, let's talk about the, um, you were saying to me before we went on, it's like a play in three acts in a way, these first nine chapters. We've got the stuff about railroads and big business. And then the second act has to do with politics. And in discussing politics in the late 19th century, Rothbard introduces two groups, and he thinks these groups hold the key to understanding party politics in the late 19th century. He says, because when you look at it on the surface, it really should seem odd to us and demanding explanation. How it could be that topics that seem so technical and obscure to us today, like the Sherman Silver Purchase Act or bimetallism or whatever, could generate such enthusiasm and could generate such heat in debate. So he began to suspect there must be something else going on here. There's something behind the scenes, something beneath the surface. And it turns out, he claims, that there was a cultural backdrop to all this. And he explains that with reference to this, these two concepts, religious concepts, the pietists and, and the liturgicals. Do you feel competent to discuss this? Because I find it uh, you know, a, a bit challenging. I get what he's saying, but I certainly wouldn't have thought of it myself. Yeah, so this is uh, it definitely, I would think, is the probably the, the very three challenging uh, chapters, especially doing the research on it. So that was definitely a, a journey. So Rothbard, at the end of chapter three, there's basically three acts, as you mentioned. The first two chapters deal with railroads, and Rothbard kind of skips, he finishes all the way to World War I. The third chapter deals with the merger movement. And then Rothbard says, well, in order to explain how business was able to try and, you know, use this government regulation, et cetera, you have to, he basically has to go through sort of a prequel story and explain how you had the fall of sort of these laissez-faire Democrats. So one of the, a significant portion of one of the political parties were sort of filled with these bourbon Democrats, these very laissez-faire uh, Democrats. You think of Grover Cleveland, et cetera. And uh, you know, exactly how did they lose their uh, positions of power in American politics? And so Rothbard goes through this whole grand analysis in the, uh, the third party system uh, and in this election of 1896, where basically these uh, laissez-faire Democrats, the Democratic Party was taken over. It was no longer the party of, say, Grover Cleveland. Instead, it was the party of, say, these uh, inflationist uh, uh, pietists, as we'll get through, uh, William Jennings, you know, led by William Jennings Bryant, sort of these populists. And this is sort of where the Democratic Party became, you know, it's more modern equivalent. And we think of all these, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term, rabid socialists. Uh, but anyway, so Rothbard, as you mentioned, he explains this whole passion in politics around this time period. People were so interested in politics. Voter turnout was higher. People were so just driven, uh, very different from today, in which you would say both the parties were very similar. Voter turnout is low. 
people aren't that very passionate. Uh, the last election is somewhat of a little bit of an outlier, uh, 2016. Uh, but Rothbard basically explained it as this cultural battle between these pietists, in particular post-millennial pietists, mainly in the Republican Party, versus these uh, liturgicals, uh, mainly in the, uh, the Democrat Party. So pietists were those who thought that you had to have you know, you, you didn't need the traditions of a church. You just had to have inner salvation. And it was your goal to not only save yourself, but save others. So that led to prohibition, uh, public schooling, immigration restriction, and that spread to economic intervention, like greenback inflationism, high tariffs, government subsidies, uh, et cetera. Liturgicals, on the other hand, it was, well, you just sort of follow the traditions of the church, uh, you know, you just have to work, care about yourself. And that led to basically more laissez-faire cultural values. You know, alcohol is OK in moderation. Uh, it shouldn't be illegal. Uh, you know, it should you know, you don't need a government for public schooling. Families can take care of their kids or you know, send them to their own private schools. And that led to more laissez-faire in the economic realm, you know, gold standard, uh, free trade, et cetera. So Rothbard sort of goes through the dynamics here. And he analyzes how the Democrats initially had this resurgence in the 1890s, but with the panic of 1893, they more or less got severely weakened, leading to the takeover by the uh, the, the uh, silver forces of William Jennings Bryan. I would spend more time on this, but what I have as my goal in this episode is to give everybody a basic overview of some of the content here so that you'll want to go read it. It's a huge book. But it's one of these books you'll treasure, you will be delighted to have in your collection. So if the first two acts are the big business and railroad question and then politics, what comes in the third act, so to speak? Sure. Yeah. So the third act is so Rothbard basically concludes with the uh, second act by saying, OK, these laissez-faire Democrats, they were wiped out. You had the beginning of the fourth party system, which is really when you have both parties are kind of similar. In Rothbard's words, they're sort of center status, um, and you have a dropout in voter turnout. And so that leads to basically special interests such as business or in particular Rothbard lays emphasis on sort of technocrats, planners, et cetera, controlling politics sort of from behind the scenes now. And since both the parties are similar, voter turnout dies, you now have the traditional sort of emergence of the progressive era. And in the sort of the final act of the unpublished chapter, so chapter seven to nine, Rothbard basically goes through the beginning of the progressive era proper, mainly the uh, presidential administration of Theodore Roosevelt uh, from 1901 to 1909 uh, in the first two uh, chapters. So kind of like railroads, he's got chapter seven is on the first, you know, President Theodore Roosevelt part one, and then he wrote chapter two and you can see he wrote Theodore Roosevelt Part Two, so explaining the various sort of government interventions during Theodore Roosevelt's administration, and the final chapter deals with uh, basically state and local progressivism uh, during the Roosevelt administration, mainly through the National Civic Federation. So the final three chapters are sort of on the progressive era proper. Theodore Roosevelt is somebody I'm very glad we now have a Rothbardian critique of because I don't think. I'm trying to think about it. I mean, I know I've read Rothbard's critique of Herbert Hoover, and I know he, he where I can find some commentary on FDR and Woodrow Wilson, but I'm not so sure there was that much that was available to us before on, certainly not this much, on Theodore Roosevelt. So this is a tremendous addition. But in that chapter, I mean, just compare it to what you would have learned in a typical schoolboy textbook about Theodore Roosevelt. Everybody loves him. They have all their reasons for loving him, but he's a he was a man of action, and he was he did all kinds of fascinating things, and and look, he intervened on behalf of the little guy in one area after another, and they just loved to talk about new regulations and the regulatory state coming into being. And Rothbard is not buying any of this story, and in particular, if I may, let's just take one issue that Rothbard treats, and that is the crusade for conservation. And this another this another thing. People say, oh, the good old Theodore Roosevelt, you know, looking out for the common good. Let's read – I'm just going to read a few paragraphs from the beginning of that section. Rothbard says, the conservation movement, past and present, has generally been painted in sweetness and light 
as disinterested nature lovers leading the people in war against corporate interests who wish to exploit and plunder natural resources. The actual facts were quite different. As Professor Samuel P. Hayes, the pioneering revisionist historian of the conservation movement, has declared, and now he quotes Hayes, the crusading quality of the conservation movement has given it an enviable reputation as a defender of spiritual values and national character. But conservation neither arose from a broad popular outcry nor centered its fire primarily upon the private corporation. Moreover, the corporations often supported conservation policies, while the people just as frequently opposed them. In fact, it becomes clear that one must discard completely the struggle against corporations as the setting in which to understand conservation history. And now back to Rothbard, he says, As in so many other aspects of the progressive movement, conservation constituted a shift of control or ownership of natural resources from private to governmental hands in order to subsidize and cartelize private interests in that area. In the name of scientific management, government intervention took two forms, either subsidize research and development in natural sources or withhold resources indefinitely from use, thereby cartelizing the resource and raising prices for private producers and increasing the capital value of resources already in private hands. Thus, as in so much of the progressive era, professionals and technocrats formed a congenial alliance with private interests. So that's just the very beginning. That's what he's preparing you for in his section on conservation. Now, try to imagine that applied to the whole progressive era, and you have this book. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. The uh, the conservation stuff is fantastic. He spends a lot of time on that. Uh, that's actually part of the uh, eighth chapter of the book where it's one of my favorite chapters might not be a standalone chapter, but like chapter three, but it's really, if you ask me what my favorite chapter would be, I'd probably have to uh, go back and forth between say three and eight. Uh, Rothbard basically talks about uh, in that chapter, he talks about the origins of uh, meat regulation. So the famous, you know, Upton Sinclair story of the jungle in the 1906 Meat Inspection Act. Then in the second uh, section of the chapter, he goes into the 1906 uh, Pure Food and Drug Act, that whole uh, motivation. And then he finishes up by talking about the conservation movement and sort of the important acts uh, involved in that. So, yeah, it's a great it's a great chapter. It's a great analysis. And it's, you know, it's Rothbard at his finest, you know, analyzing the motivations of all of the uh, the intellectuals and other major players and, you know, really going through how. Uh, government intervention was used to sort of stamp out competition, and it was a product of sort of rival bureaucratic and business interests. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great chapter. I am particularly fond of a chapter in this collection called World War I as Fulfillment. Uh, I think it's Power in the Intellectuals might be the subtitle. It's been a while. I have the book right in front of me, and I don't know why I'm not flipping through. But anyway, that is such a tremendous chapter, that alone. Because what he's done there is he's looked at what contemporary so-called progressive intellectuals had to say about the opportunity that World War I presented them. Because they realized that this is their opportunity to plan an economy. And, of course, the, the rationale will be we have to be as efficient as possible uh, in you know, prosecuting the war. And we have to make sure that resources are directed appropriately. And they, they can't just be used willy-nilly in the private sector when we need to summon them for use in this great national emergency. And furthermore, there you can find progressive intellectuals saying, finally, this will once and for all disabuse people of their notions and attachment – notions of and attachment to private property as being sacred and inviolable because it's not going to be. There are going to be all kinds of rules and regulations imposed on people, and maybe that will get them accustomed to this for the future. So there's plenty of that. You think that sounds made up. No one could be that twisted. But yeah, that's actually what they were saying. Yeah, you're exactly uh, you're exactly right. It's a great analysis. Uh, the World War One is fulfillment chapter. It's a previous essay that came out in like 1989 or something. You know, that's Rothbard at his finest. A lot of people might say, you know, if you think about what it's Rothbard's, you know, greatest historical papers, et cetera, that would definitely be up there in the running. I think most people would say that. Yeah, he goes through the whole motivations of intellectuals and the whole transformation of the ideology of intellectuals during World War One, And, you know, really for Rothbard, you know, it was the fulfillment of the progressive era. So he also had a, 
uh, a, a previous essay written in the 70s that's included in the book on World War One, on war collectivism on big businesses. And, you know, he sort of uses both of those to show that, well, this was the really when businesses, you had this grand alliance of between big business, big government, big intellectuals and big unions, this corporate system that was trying to get off the ground during the progressive era. You know, it finally gets off the ground during World War One. And so many of the things, uh, the, the government agencies, the war industries board, uh, et cetera, that were being utilized during World War One, it was the inspiration for uh, much of the New Deal uh, in, the, uh, in the Roosevelt administration, like the national, uh, you know, the, the, the NRA. And uh, yes, it's a fascinating chapter. It's got a lot of stuff. It's uh, for a lot of people. They said that most people just thought, okay, Rothbard might wanted to write a book on the progressive era. And this is the only thing that came of it. Uh, this essay. Uh, one other fascinating thing about this essay that's in the book is that we actually, he wrote an additional section of the essay that he, he mentioned in one of the footnotes at the beginning of the essay, when it was published, he said, oh, due to space constraints, you can't really spend too much time on this. Well, we've included it as an appendix. So he talks about sort of the centralization of science, uh, I believe with the National Research Council uh, during this, uh, uh, during World War I. And he really just goes through the traditional process, you know, the, the, how intellectuals were able to use the government and, and it was all involved in sort of centralized science and uh, move it away from sort of the more decentralized, the laissez-faire uh process that it was before and yeah so the whole chapter is great uh in terms of favorite just because i'm a monetary historian i love the paper that came right after that which is the federal reserve as a cartelization device uh but really you know all the chapters all the published papers are great uh, especially the chapter 13. yeah 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 then of course is the great uh, chapter on hoover which is which was revisionist in its day basically but now everybody sort of knows hoover was um, you know a uh, proto-progressive at the very least. He, the idea that he was for laissez-faire is contradicted by his repeated insistence, uh, not to mention the things he actually did. The, the, there's another um, World War I chapter, uh, War Collectivism in World War I, that's very good, that actually details some of precisely what happened in the economy and what interests were served by it and issues of that nature. And what's interesting there is that that appeared in a book, I think in maybe 1973, that was co-edited with a guy on the new left. And so Rothbard was able to make a laissez-faire case in his chapter to that kind of audience because he was able to say, look at how these big businesses prospered by their cushy relationship with the government. Well, that's music to their ears. You know, they're they're as outraged by that as we would be. And so that was, uh, you know, his way of trying to reach beyond his, you know, maybe more natural audience. So you put all this together and it's a tremendous volume that uh, we're not going to attempt to do full justice to because the only way to do that is to read it for yourself. And the book is simply called The Progressive Era. I will link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1140. You can get it in numerous formats, but get it, you should, because um, I have to assume, uh, you know, maybe Patrick, maybe you, you'll contradict me on this. I have to assume the number of remaining Rothbard manuscripts in the archives has to be dwindling at this point. <laughs> uh, yes, one would uh, believe so. There, there might be some more stuff uh, working on, you know, that we'd love to get out. But yeah, so we are, uh, at least in terms of the major works, we're trying to get everything out. Uh, but yeah, so you would, uh, you, you would, you would think that someone who's been dead for twenty years, uh, twenty, you know, twenty plus years, uh, their unpublished stuff, you'd be, you, you would have exhausted it by now. But uh, you know, Rothbard never fails the surprise. And uh, yeah, but we are we are slowly making it to to the end, and I'm very glad we were able to bring this project uh, to completion. I really think somebody ought to make a list of the stuff that's been published since his death, just for fun, just a blog post of the stuff that's come out since his death that's been put together. I mean, that, that just just his stuff on on the relationship between the government and science. I devoted an episode of this show to just reviewing that essay. I guess I'll link to that episode in the show notes page for today, but just a lot of great, great stuff. But the progressive era is the book I've been waiting for for a long time. I knew it existed and I knew at some point it would see the light of day. And now it's tremendous to actually be holding it in my hands as we speak. So thank you for your service, Patrick Newman. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me on.
All right, folks, I have to run. I've got a special guest coming over to the house today, and I am completely unprepared. So I better go take care of that, but I will see you tomorrow. Thanks so much for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.